Our scripture reading today is from Matthew 26, 69 to 75. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is the word of the Lord. And together we say, thanks be to God. Thank you. Uh, 13 years ago, Nina and I, we were just starting to date, and uh, it was Valentine's Day, so um, I had to go big or go home. I prepared. And I wanted to impress her how awesome I am in everything that I do. I wanted to show her how courageous and how brave and so I am. And so I thought about what would be an activity that would uh, spark all of that, all of my strength. And so I thought about, oh, I've seen in movies skydiving. So let me just pick that as our first uh, Valentine's date. And so I researched and found uh, skydiving. Any sky, uh, sk- skydiving folks here? Okay, few. All right. Okay, so uh, never done it before. Just looked up something and found one in Monterey. We drove there for our first Valentine's date. And I get there, and we walk into this building, and there's like 15 waivers to sign. says, hey, if you die, you cannot sue. I'm like, well, if I'm dead, I can't sue you anyways. But, uh, and you're signing all these forms, and I'm now, all of a sudden, uh, fear has entered into my heart. And these instructors are coming in, and they are like, hey, listen, uh, you, do you guys all know how to do leg lifts? And I'm like, leg lifts? What does that have to do with skydiving? Well, as you land, you want to lift your legs up, and you want to land on your butt because if you land with your legs coming down, it's going to just snap. And so you want to make sure, do you know, I'm like, well, and I'm going, well, I don't really have core strength. And so now I'm like, okay, I got to save all my energy, but I already paid my money. And so I'm there and uh, we get in and then I realize that it, this is because we are first timers, this is tandem skydiving, meaning that I'm actually not with my girlfriend. I'm just with an older uh, male gentleman hugging me. uh, And uh, another uh, man is holding my girlfriend and I paid him $200 to hold my girlfriend. And so I'm like, this is not how I prepared uh, my Valentine's to be. And we get on the airplane and we're up 10, 15,000 feet. And uh, they, there are about 15 of us. They open the uh, aircraft door. And this, again, it's February. This cold air from Monterey is coming in. And I'm the first in line. And so I hold on to the aircraft. I look at my instructor and say, I'm so sorry. Please save me. And, and he's heard this many times. And he just smiles. And I say, I can't. I can't. And so now... Everyone else is uh, behind me, and they can't really go until I go. And I'm just there, and I'm thinking through, through all the things where Nina's second in line, and she's looking at me, and I believe, oh, man, so disappointed at, at uh, uh, just, I thought, and all of this. And so the instructor constantly is now listening to everything that I say, and uh, I think, again, he's had enough, and he, he says, we're going, and he just pushes me out. <laughs> And, um, and uh, overconfidence uh, in, uh, I didn't do any research, I thought this would be easy, uh, was pretty costly for my first Valentine's Day. Uh, but if I'm being honest, uh, uh, my overconfidence made me really blind to all sorts of things. I, uh, it was so cold that by the time we landed, both Nina and I, we got sick. And so we had to cancel our dinner reservation. And we went home, and um, I didn't even get to hold my girlfriend the entire time. Again, another older male instructor did. Um, Such a sad way to end my Valentine's. Um, 
And uh, uh, while overconfidence ruined my first Valentine's Day, uh, it becomes more serious in our discipleship to uh, Jesus. Uh, in our discipleship to Jesus, uh, as we, especially as we take grounds in uh, certain sins and habits in our lives, there's a danger of all of us becoming spiritually overconfident. Uh, we get a sense that we have a good handle on our faith, and especially if you've been following Jesus for a long time, you're like, I know Jesus, I've known him for a long time. And there's, by the way, confidence. Uh, the scripture talks about examining your faith and having the right kind of confidence of your faith in Jesus is important. Um, but in our overconfidence, we can become blind to our weaknesses and sometimes our Strength, even, that has served us so well uh, can um, lead to self-reliance and even hurting those around us in our own pride and our passion. Uh, and some of us in this room, uh, with a room this size, maybe uh, that's not your struggle. You're like, hey, I'm not, that's not part of my journey. I don't, over, uh, overconfidence is not. Maybe you're on the other side where you have, you're filled with uh, fears and insecurities, and you deal with more of shame and lack of self-worth, and that causes you to hide and self-isolate. Uh, pride, overconfidence, or shame, they are two strong forces that disconnect us with our life in God and with others and prevents us from becoming a people of love. Ultimately, in our pride and shame, we reject Jesus and his grace poured out for us. And so Matthew, uh, as we will be reading together, uh, invites us to consider through the story of Peter's denial, uh, Jesus' gracious invitation to healing, restoration, and freedom from our life of pride and shame. So we pray for that when we heal for that with our time together by his grace alone. So let's pray together. So Jesus, uh, for those who have been following you for a week to decades and decades, uh, we can relate to our journey of pride, overconfidence, and shame. And so we ask that you would graciously invite us to, uh, to a place where you can speak to us with words of grace and kindness, healing and freedom. That's what we long for. So we pray for that um, only by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, if we haven't met, I'm David and part of the team here. And uh, before we uh, go into the passage that we just read, chapter 26, 69 to 75, I, I want to put this in context. So I'm going to go a few verses earlier to 35, uh, 31 to 35. And it says this. Then Jesus said to them, uh, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all will fall away because of you, all my friends, they're not really good at following you, Jesus, but I am. What a great friend he is. Uh, but I will never fall away. My friends, yeah, they're shaking their faith, but I'm pretty awesome in my discipleship to you. Uh, we see Peter's overconfidence, his pride here. He says, I will never. And usually when someone says the word never in communication, it's rarely a good sign. Uh, if you're fighting, for example, not that any of us fight, uh, but if you fight with a spouse, and I have never said this to Nina in our fight, you know, you never take out the trash or things like that, right? Um, and we, we sometimes we use these never, these larger exa exaggerated statements. And honestly, if we're just being honest, this is kind of Peter's uh, moment here. He says, I, I, like he uses this big word never, but, um, but it's, he's, uh, he's lying to himself. Um, he is filled with his own image of who he is and his reality is shaped by his own pride. And um, he cannot see who really uh, he is. And um, in light of that, uh, we see Jesus saying to him in the next verses following, Jesus says to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me 
three times. Peter said to him, even if I must deny you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Uh, Peter says, I'm not even afraid of death itself, Jesus. Um, And no matter what Jesus says, he doesn't back down. He even corrects Jesus. Um, And you see, overconfidence doesn't have much room for curiosity and humble reflection. If Peter did, instead of a statement, uh, he would have asked Jesus something along the lines of, Jesus, why do you say that I will deny you three times? Or, Jesus, what do you know about me that I'm not aware of? This could have led to a deeper conversation about Peter's habits, uh, patterns, wirings, and personality type. And and Peter could have then received uh, from Jesus his wisdom and strength and insight into his own reality. But overconfidence really blinds Peter. And overconfidence blinds Peter from this truth that Jesus knows Peter better than Peter knows himself. Um, And this is our journey. Um, I remember uh, just uh, last week, we uh, got to send off uh, Steve and Dana. And a few weeks before that, um, we had our final, our our staff had a final staff meeting with Steve and Dana. And Jay asked uh, Steve to come up and share his final words of uh, encouragement to the staff. And so, man, like Steve's last words to our staff. It was really meaningful, powerful. So I'm just ready to receive anything and everything that he has to say as he uh, sends us off. And um, I was not expecting what would be the first sentence that would come out of his mouth. He came up and he said, "Um, hey, um, if I have hurt you or offended you in any way, I just want to first say, I apologize. I'm not a perfect leader, and I ask for your forgiveness. And uh, at that moment, the first thing that came to my mind was, Lord, please help me to get to, you know, I'm now close to 40 this year and been in ministry 20 years. Please, Lord, as I continue to follow after you, that, that the first thing that comes out of my mouth would be that a posture of humility posture of repentance, posture of recognition that I am not all that and that I still have room for growth and that I'm here to learn and grow and apologize. And what, as I was preparing for my message, just just Peter versus just the great model of Steve that's been for us, I could not help but to notice that. But, uh, But a deep prayer for me, just at that moment, I just paused and said, Lord, Would you please help me to become that as well? Please help me to become that in my own journey with you. Now with that, we come to Matthew 26, 69 through 75, our main text for our conversation today. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean, but he denied it before them all saying, I don't know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another serving girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. Peter, the one whom Jesus calls the rock, right? Simon, now your name is Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and, and even the gates of Hades shall not prevail. This Peter probably wasn't expecting himself to be stumbled upon by a servant girl. Just he, that, that wasn't what he had in mind, uh, but he is stumbled by this servant girl. This is why we cannot overestimate our ability to overcome sin. Friends, this is why we cannot overestimate our ability to overcome sin. doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus. We must have a posture that says, Jesus, without you, I can fall apart at any moment. And um, Peter, um, 
he goes into this incredible self-preservation and self-protection mode. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and this is, by the way, it's been there since the beginning of time. Abraham lied about Sarah. King David preserved his own life over Uriah. And this is why confession, vulnerability, and honesty are so difficult in our life with God. Yet, the invitation for all followers of Jesus is self-denial, the, to surrender, to lay down our lives, but it is certainly while this is a most joyful, the most joyful and purpose-filled path, it's definitely a narrow path, as Jesus would say. Self-preservation, self-protection is in all of us in our journey uh, of discipleship to Jesus. Um, we immigrated here when, uh, when I was 10. My brother is six years younger than me, and so he was four at the time, and uh, we were in New York, as many of you know, and lived in Boston. And uh, many years later, uh, while my brother was about to enter middle school, my parents decided that they t- uh, to, uh, f- to take this job from back in South Korea. And so they looked at both of us. My brother was just about to start middle school. I'm just about to go to college and said, guys, good luck in America. We're going to go. And so we're like, what? And so uh, they left. Uh, They went back to South Korea. And um, so now I was trying to figure out how to be a father and raise my brother. I started uh, taking on four different jobs to uh, take care of him and feed him. And I'm just trying to scramble. And and in that very place, I remember, like, we used to just play video games all day long. And and, uh, we didn't have any parental oversight. And so we just did whatever we wanted. And... um, and my parents, uh, they would call us and check in on us time to time and, and, uh, and ask my brother, hey, like, how are your grades? Um, and uh, my, my brother said, oh, mom, like, did you not hear? And mom's like, what are you talking about? In America, they actually got rid of the grading system. Um, <laughs> You know, with all the heightened anxiety and performance uh, anxiety that is in the midst of the younger generation, they decided that A, B, C, D, like, like that's terrible. And so there are no report cards in America. And, um, and my brother, of course, uh, he's trying to just protect him, his own life from the wrath of his parents. And uh, um, that's how he survived. Every time they would ask every quarter. And my brother said, I, I never got report. We don't have that in America. And so... Uh, they visited us one summer, and uh, I kid you not, uh, my mom was uh, vacuuming the floor, and she tripped on one of the wires and hit a bookshelf. And, in the, and from that bookshelf, one book fell where my brother would stuff all of his previous report cards. <laughs> it was the Lord. <laughs> That only that book fell and all the reporter's cards just fell right up. And, and my mom said, what is this? And my brother still said, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and, uh, and self-protection is deep in our bones. And, and we get it, right? We want to survive and we don't, we, we don't want to get in trouble. And, and for Peter too, it's like, hey, like I... Jesus, like, I, I don't know who he is. I don't know what, he's, what, he, what you're talking about. I've never heard of him and a way in which to take care and cover yourself. In Matthew 26, 69, it says this, after a little while, and by the way, uh, I'll leave to your imagination what happened to my brother that day. <laughs> uh, bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly, You too are one of them, uh, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself. Uh, In Greek, uh, there is no word on himself. That's what I think the translators are uh, thinking that he's doing. But um, almost all scholars agree that this is just he began to invoke a curse to just Jesus. Um, And... um, I mean, it makes sense. He's got to survive here, right? And um, so he says, I, I don't know Jesus. And, like, and he begins to curse him. You see, like, I'm just cursing Jesus. I have no relationship to him. And I, I, I don't follow him. I don't even like him. And this is what the extent that Peter does to survive and cover for himself and to swear, I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept 
bitterly. Uh, shame, sorrow uh, begins to fill Peter's heart. Uh, makes sense. Uh, Jesus took incredible care for Peter. And uh, Peter, again, many chapters before, Jesus spoke in powerful words of affirmation and strength to Peter. Uh, you are no longer Simon, but Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. And, and Jesus uh, uh, just loved him and loved him and cared for him. And yet Peter uh, did not return that love back to him with allegiance and faithfulness. Um, but this isn't just a story of Peter and you see this painting and it's just like to kind of capture this moment here and in his pain, um, this isn't just Peter, uh, but this is supposed to be a mirror for all of us. We too have received much from Jesus. We too have received uh, eternal life uh, through his death and resurrection, his kindness and his unconditional love and care. But in our, in our reality of our, the way we live uh, our uh, um, time here, in Silicon Valley, uh, we too have uh, denied and rejected Jesus many times. Uh, it's not just Peter. If we're being honest in our relationships, in our workplaces, marriage, family, uh, Jesus calls us to love, to sacrifice, to forgive, to care for one another. But in our self-protection, in our over, we say no, like, uh, we resist Jesus, we deny his voice, we deny his invitation, and uh, we refuse to cooperate with his spirit. Uh, with our finances, uh, Jesus says, I have given you everything, my, my eternal kingdom, but we rather still hold on a little bit too tight. While Jesus says it is better to uh, give than to receive, um, we uh, don't believe his words and we reject his voice over our lives. And so we become less generous with our time and energy. We hear Jesus's words to serve and he has given us the energy and the strength to serve one another. I mean, just Mark just said, hey, we have 50 folks that we need to, and by the way, this is not a shame statement. Like, hey, we, we have so many, God has gracious with thousands of folks who will be coming into our Easter services. For some, they will be hearing Jesus for the first time. And hey, we have still 50 spots left to serve. And, and for many of us, and again, this is not the shame. Like, I feel that too. Like, hey, like, I'm busy. I have this. And, and I'm raising young kids. And, and I work in uh, tech for 80 hours. And so I rather not. And I, we refuse to hear the voice of Jesus. And we deny. Uh, for some, you... You are still dealing with a ton of anger and withdrawal and, and from all the triggers of your past. And Jesus is inviting you to work through your pain and trauma and, and work through some of the ways in which the triggers are affecting your deepest relationships. And But that requires work. And so you say, no, Jesus, again and again and again, though you know that that's the place that you need to step into to find healing and restoration. Uh, it just costs too much of your time and energy and research. So you say, no. And even Easter coming in a few weeks, um, Jesus is inviting us to consider someone to bring, our neighbor, our friend, and co-workers. Uh, but Jesus, I, man, I, that's too much because what happened if I say and they say no and it's like I'm filled with shame and rejection. So instead of that, I'll just reject you to begin with. I, I and and by the way, I know all this because that's just part of my own discipleship to Jesus. And, and all of us, we don't just see Peter, but here in our text, we see a little bit of our own journey. And we too have used the words never. Um, maybe we've numbed ourselves by watching porn, over drinking, overeating, or lusting after the same person. And we say, God, I will never do this again. But we wake up another day and we fall again 
and again. We yell at our kids or we get into a fight with someone that we love. And, oh, God, this is the last time I will raise my voice. I will never do this again. God, you have called me to a life of love. Uh, I, I, I will never do this again. And in our honesty, that is true. We, we long for that. I'm not saying you and I are liars. And I think Peter really longed for that. Uh, but with our own strength, that is not possible. Um, and we are filled with shame and guilt. Gospel of Luke, uh, in light of our pride and shame and, and all of our ups and downs and our own self-protection and, and our own overconfidence in our discipleship to Jesus, Gospel of Luke captures an interesting uh, uh, um, insight into this reality. So let me just read Luke 22, 31 through 32, and we'll have it up for a second for us. Simon, Simon, uh, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. I wonder why Jesus intentionally said Simon, Simon, instead of his traditional word, Simon, Peter. Because maybe, just maybe, Jesus is saying, Simon, Simon, would you remember your humanity? I know you're all worked up and you think you can handle your faith and you think you can overcome all sins and that you won't be self-protecting. But Simon, would you remember your humanity? Maybe that's why he repeated his name, Simon, Simon. And, um, and we also see another uh, thing in this whole picture that Satan has asked to sift all of you as we... Satan desires nothing more than our destruction. The enemy of God is at work to steal, kill, and destroy. Um, Westgate family, um, just a quick kind of note. Uh, be aware of over-spiritualizing, blaming Satan for everything and not taking ownership, right? We have, uh, that could be a temptation of ours. Uh, but be also aware of under-spiritualizing, that recognizing that there are forces of evil at work to bring Peter and all of us down in our allegiance to Jesus. And with all of that, we see something really comforting here. Satan has asked Jesus, meaning even Satan himself is under the authority of Christ. Satan does not have full authority over this world. We see kind of the, the callback to Job a little bit there. And even Satan, he is not the king of this world. He bows to the feet of Jesus. And we find comfort that Jesus still is the ruler over this broken and, and chaotic world. And so I find a lot of comfort in that. And not only that, Jesus uh, prays for Simon, and he prays for us that in our own journey of pride and shame and self-protection, Jesus is praying for us. He's not going there, uh, I wonder whether you're going to fall again or not. But there's a posture in which Hebrews talks about Jesus intercedes. And he is praying on our behalf that our faith would not fail. And I love this. And when you have turned back, Peter, you won't make mistakes, but when you have turned back, Remember that, that you have a purpose, that Satan will make you fall so that it robs you of your calling, destiny in your own life that God is writing. And so when you have turned back and your calling is what? Go strengthen your brothers again. That's what God has called you to do. He is restoring you to live that very purpose out. And oftentimes in our pride, in our shame, uh, we are not only disconnected from God and others, but we fail to really live up to all that God is inviting us to live up to, which could be a blessing to our community and around the world. Matthew 26, uh, 26, 74 to 75 says this. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed and Peter Remember the saying of Jesus before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. 
and when he went out, uh, and he went out and wept uh, bitterly. Have you ever wondered why Jesus says, "Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times"? I feel like rooster, you know, rooster crows throughout the day. Uh, it's a very common and familiar sound in Peter's days. And Jesus uses a common sound of the day to remind Peter of his voice and Peter's weakness. Um, re- look at this first. Uh, after Peter hears the sound, he remembers the words of Jesus. Rooster uh, uh, and this loud uh, uh, crowing of the rooster is God's signal to remind and awaken the soul of Peter. Rooster crowing is God's Grace. Um, Rooster crowing isn't just a reminder of Peter's failures and his weaknesses, though that is true, and he comes to recognition of that. Uh, um, But as Peter gets restored, um, maybe in the first few months, as he hears the rooster again and again, I bet he is filled with much pain and shame for denying and rejecting Jesus. But as the years go on, as he hears the rooster crow again and again, now he's the leader of the church. And as you know, he, uh, as the church history would say, he, he, he becomes faithful follower of Jesus and he dies upside down for Jesus and his kingdom. And uh, I wonder down the road as he hears rooster, he remembers God's forgiveness and grace upon his very life. And how comforting that is, that he's still able to recognize his own weaknesses, but God's incredible grace in his life. Um, What might be the rooster moment that God is inviting you to consider? Uh, As some of you know my story, um, and I share this a lot because it has become a rooster moment for me. uh, As our family got into an accident six, seven years ago now, And uh, now every time I see a car accident or traffic, which happens all the time in Silicon Valley, um, I am reminded of the person I was uh, at that time where I was incredibly addicted to work and achievement. And by the way, I still have work to do, but I am, uh, God, God awakened me from that reality through the accident but God also showed incredible grace and protection over our family and his kindness towards us. And so now that now, many years later, every time I see an accident, I do. Not almost every time is maybe, but oftentimes as I see an accident, I, I think to myself, God, uh, a reminder from God uh, of my own weaknesses that I am still left to myself, uh, tempted to seek achievement and my own life and my own workaholic spirit that over uh, the things that really matter in my life, my wife, my kids, family, and the kingdom of God. Um, I, I shared with you about my brother. We, um, I wasn't really, um, you know, I, I have a lot of shame during those years uh, when I was uh, raising my brother because I wasn't supposed to be a parent at 18 or 19, and I didn't know how to be a father, and um, I didn't really model uh, what it means to follow Jesus faithfully at home, and, um, and I have deep regrets. Again, um, yes. That's not something my father should have done, and that's something that I had to work with my father. But still, I had to own the things that was mine. I still did what I did at home. And just growing up together, uh, I remember like forgetting to, I mean, yes, I, I did what I could. You know, I worked four jobs to take care of my brother and taught him how to drive. And now knowing my story, I shouldn't have taught him how to drive. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, and I, I went to his middle school graduation, went to his high school graduation, went to his college graduation. And, um, but all those years, uh, like I remember in those winter storms of Boston, uh, I, I was hanging out with my ex-girlfriend. It's not Nina and that's a different story. Lord, forgive me. <laughs> and, uh, 
and uh, just forgetting to uh, know what time it is. And, and uh, I forgot to pick up my brother. And uh, he walked all the way home in the winter storms of Boston for an hour straight. And uh, I remember him looking at me saying, where were you? Um, where were you when I needed you the most? You know? And, you know, I, I understand Peter. I, I do understand Peter. Uh, there are parts of our lives where it's filled with shame. And we don't want to think about it, right? We don't want to think about it. But Jesus invites us to think of those rooster moments in our life so that he can restore us and give us a new purpose and meaning for all of us. And I remember uh, he asked me on his wedding day to be his best man. And uh, what an honor it is. And even though all of those years, I just want to delete it because I just did not model the way of Jesus in his life. I did not. And, um, but he asked me and I was grateful. And in Korean weddings, there's a, a tradition where because of our kind of that communal and culture that we are, we, there's a moment in the service where we stop kind of the process of the wedding, where we, we, we pause and uh, they go down to, and, and say goodbyes to their parents, but also they, they also thank them and honor them as an honor culture that, that uh, Asian cultures are. And so we honor. And so my brother and, and his wife goes down and honors and hugs both of the parents and says, thank you. And they get up and, and you know, and we're about to move on to the next phase of our ceremony. And, um, and, and he looks at the wedding officiant and says, I have one more father to honor. And he turns to me. And um, out of the Korean uh, respect, he bows and says, Hyung, which means brother in Korean. Hyung, thank you for raising me. Thank you for raising me. I appreciate all that you've done for me, my life. And I lost it and because I did not deserve those words from my brother, you know? I deserved everything but that. In our life with Jesus, there are places and moments in our lives where we are, we are filled with shame. We too have denied him in many ways. But shame does not have the last word because Christ's grace comes before us. And he longs to restore you and I in our overconfidence, in our overprotection, in areas in our lives that we just rather forget. For you, maybe you're a young parent and you hear those loud cries of your child and you are filled with frustration. You shouldn't be in your heart, but you do. You're left with your weaknesses and exhaustion but you may hear in those rooster moments, God's grace over you. Maybe for you, you are an adult parent and you look back, now they're a lot older, but you may have some regrets, but that's not the end of the story because God's grace covers us and longs to restore us. And even the places where we feel like there is no hope, God is at work. Maybe there are places in your life right now that you, have, you are still saying no to Jesus. No, Jesus, not that, not that part of my life. But Jesus, in his gentle invitation, he longs to waken us to the reality and the beauties of his grace and his kindness. And would you hear his invitation to come home and to receive his strength? First Peter 4, 10 through 11. Now, Apostle Paul, I mean, Apostle Peter is 
uh, towards the end of his journey, and now Peter is writing uh, for the church. Imagine Peter, who said no to Jesus and denied him, protected himself. First Peter 4, 10 says this. I wonder if this comes from his own journey. And he says, I know this God as a God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, because I've done that too, I've made mistakes, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Because that's what he did with me, and that's what he will do with you. To him, to Jesus be the power forever and ever and amen. Because without the power of Jesus, no way we can be faithful to him. So would you bow your hearts with me and close your eyes? So Jesus, we say, we cannot, we cannot follow you faithfully. Left to our own selves, we will be too proud or too full of shame to engage you in a way that's honoring. And so Jesus, we seek your grace. Would you touch our lives? We thank you. We thank you that you do not deny us when we have denied you many times. We love you. Let us become more faithful in our discipleship to you. In Jesus' name, amen.